Thank you, though. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you so much for coming, all of you. It was like, um, I feel humbled that you all, are, you all are here with me today to see my work. I have been taking part in different um, exhibitions, but they've always been in a group show. So this is my first solo exhibition, and this is for Karuna's like push. <laughs> she pushed me. <laughs> and I want to thank my family also. I'm actually under the weather today, so my voice is like kind of like <laughs> I'm drugged right now. <laughs> all the claritin and all those things <laughs> are kicking in right now. So I want to thank my family also. Zahid, my husband, he has always been such a huge support for me. He has always been and uh, like, a, like a rock for me. And I always leaned on him whenever, you know, like paint. I was doing paintings and he was like, Okay. He was. Ne he never bothered me to cook or do anything. He was like always. I am cooking, so I, it was actually I was painting. <laughs> and I also want to thank my three children, Walid, Hamza, and Halima. They have been an inspiration for me to like. They have been the source to push me forward to do this solo exhibition. So I really thank you, three of you, a lot. Um, so we are here to like see art. So what is art actually, anyone? So art is actually like a visual experience. When you look at a painting, it can be a uh, like a joyful experience when you look at it, or it can be an intellectual one, or it can also be an emotional one. So when you look at art, you have to see, you have to find these three things in them. And um, a lot of like, time people think that art is something which is like, you know, it doesn't make a difference. It's like uh, not of something of a lot of significance. But I would say that it does mean a lot, and it does make a social and political difference in the society. And it is because when you look at an artwork and you are connected with it, it becomes like a source of uh, connection. And it is like, uh, it gives you, now I'm blank. <laughs> it, it gives you, you know, a, uh, source of energy, and it gives you also a topic, a subject to think about. So if it has like a, um, a subject which is very meaningful, a political or a social issue, then actually when you are connecting with that art, you take that along when you go out of that gallery or from room, and you, you talk to the other person about it. And once you start talking about that piece, about that topic with another person, you're actually connecting and carrying the message along. And that's how you make a difference when you are talking about that issue, whether it's a political issue or a social issue. So I hope that my art is inspiration, inspirational for you and your, like all the friends that I have over here. And uh, um, I hope it is a joyful experience for you as well as an emotional and intellect experience for you all. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. Um, as Karuna, thank you for that lovely introduction and hearing my mom also give us some notes. I have lots going in my mind about how to explain this art to all of you. I've been tasked with preparing all of you to go see the art that's downstairs, which we, some of you have already looked at, but some of you will be looking at um, soon. I'm not an artist. I'm not an art historian. I'm a textual studies person. I'm a philologist. I'm somebody who works with language. That's what really drives my intellectual pursuits. So the way that I've interacted with my mom's art has been through her use of language, primarily. And what I'd like to do for you today is to give you a little bit of a sense of the philosophy behind this kind of art, the philosophy that's informed my mom and all the people that have informed her, um, to place situate my mom's work within a larger art movement and a larger art world, and what it produces and what it represents. 
when I asked my mom, we were putting together this uh, exhibition and I asked her, what is the name of this collection? She said, Dear America is the name of this collection. <laughs> And I've thought about that title quite a bit. I haven't talked to her about any more about what that meant, but I'm going to try together exactly at the end to explain to you how this is about America specifically. But before I do that, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the tradition and about the history. So you're looking at these pieces of art, and the first thing to understand is that in the Islamic tradition, the tradition that my mom is in a sense coming out of, or part of what informs her art, in the Islamic tradition, form and text are totally bound together. The word is the form, the form is the text. Part of that is historical. It's just because the early Muslims and in medieval period also, the, uh, there was an aversion to depicting icon uh, iconic art, animate art. And so artists were pushed towards uh, other kinds of forms. And the word, the text itself, emerges within the Islamic world as a artistic medium. Most of the time, when you're looking, if you're in the Taj Mahal, or if you're in a mosque, or if you're in an Islamic uh, sacred site, you'll see the walls are plastered with text. But most people that are in these spaces can't read. Most people, historically, that we're talking about that have seen the Taj Mahal have no idea what all that stuff says. Um, and even if they were able to read it, it's highly stylized. It's not immediately uh, apparent exactly what the text is. But what I mean to underscore here is that the text itself, just the fact that they know that what they're seeing is text, is meaning enough. Because the text is what's sacred. The text is the form. The form is the text. That's how a lot of Muslims... Yeah, yeah. There is, it's verses from the Quran. It is, yeah. It's an inscription from the Quran. But the way that people interact with it is not that they walk up to the gates of the Taj Mahal and they read the verses and they're like, oh, that's what it says. No. The way people interact with the text is as though it's art. They know that what it's saying is the words of God, of Allah, written on this monument. And that's where the meaning lies. The, ex the exact specificity of what the text means is secondary. Uh, what I mean to show is, again, the fluidity between text and form in the Islamic tradition. The art that you're seeing here that my mom has produced is an example of that, about how form and text are melded together in this particular type of art that comes out of the Islamic world. In the Indian subcontinent, that art takes on another valence because it's flushed with the rich artistic tradition of India, and it becomes something different. The art you're looking at right now is not just straight up Islamic art. It's an Islamic art layered with an Indic uh, aesthetic, layered with an American experience. It's lots and lots of different layers. Uh, but I'm going to go back all the way to the 7th century, the time that I'm comfortable with. <laughs> <laughs> the period that I look at. And I'll try to bring you guys back to uh, 2019. Although I'm not convinced anything better is happening in 2019 than back in the day. <laughs> So what I'd like to do for, for all of you first is to explain to you the form, the shamsa. Most of the art that you're looking at in this exhibition is centered around this particular form called the shamsa, which just means the sun, the solar disk, to be very exact. And usually in old classical Islamic art, the shamsa appears in manuscripts of the Quran. It's associated with... Uh, it's associated as a sacred form. However, within the Islamic tradition, there's also this interesting tension about the sun being a divine or a sacred symbol. There's an aversion to that. It's an interesting tension because it appears everywhere in Islamic art. But there's an aversion to the sun being an object of worship. So what, in fact, does the shamsa represent? What I wanted to do was to give you, go all the way back and go to the Quran, give you guys a little sense of the Quran. The word shams and shamsa appears all over the Quran. And it's a naturalistic image. It's the image of the solar disk. And uh, as a naturalistic image, the first thing I want to explain to you is how it's embedded in a social reality. Even though it's a naturalistic image, it's embedded within a social reality. What I'd like to do for you is to read some lines from the Quran itself, which are talking about the shams. And I'm going to read two passages from the Quran and explain each of them to you and how they tie to this particular form. I'd like to read it in Arabic just because I think it's interesting. It's part of the experience to hear what it sounds like. Most people that listen to these verses experience them orally, even if they don't know what they mean. And then I'll share with you what the translation, what these words uh, mean. First, I just want you guys to hear what the sound is. It's this thing called 
Saj. Most of the Quranic verses are in this form called Saj, which is like a rhymed prose. It's like it's not exactly poetry. It's kind of like prose, but it has a rhyme within it. So this is the first passage, and it's named Surat Ash-Shams, which means the verse of the sun. And the Arabic is Washamsi wa duhaha wal qamri idha talaha wal niharu idha jallaha wal laylu idha yakhshaha wal samai wa ma banaha wal ardi wa ma tahaha wal nafsin wa ma sawaha fa allahumuhuma faj fujurahuma wa taqwaha qad aflaha man zakkaha What this means is by the sun the solar disk by the shamsa it's a it's an oath i swear by the sun by the sun and by her brilliance, and the moon that follows her through the sky, and the day that reveals her and the night that conceals her, by the cosmos and that which fashions it, by the earth and that which fastens it, and by the self and that which has rendered it proportional, and that which has inspired it, the discernment of wickedness and goodness. Whomever purges the self will succeed and whoever embeds the self will fail. These are cryptic words. It's hard to imagine exactly. You could go on and on about what this means. But the aspect of it which is interesting to me is how within the Islamic tradition, this naturalistic image is embedded into an ethical reality. It's not just a thing in the sky. It's something that pertains to an ethical world on the ground, a politics on the ground. Let me give you another example. This is another example where this, the Quran talks about the shams. And it's a famous passage and has a historical background to it. The pre-Islamic Arabs, the Arabians that I study most of the time, <clears throat> had a very horrendous practice of female infanticide, which is that if the first child born in a family was a woman, the child would typically be killed in a form of ritual execution. This was not practiced by the lower classes. This was practiced by the elites of the society. It was seen as a way of purging the womb of the sin of a girl child. In the Quran, this image appears of the girl child being killed, appears within a, again in relationship to this naturalistic image of the sun. I'm going to read for you guys. Are you okay listening to Arabic again? Okay, let's do some Arabic. Maybe I'll translate it as I go. Well, okay. This is also a highly poetic, poetic passage re talking about the sun again, the shamsa. Yes. Just to hear the whole thing? Okay, so I'll do that. Good, I like that option. Okay. Ida shamsu kuwirat, wedan nujumun kadarat, wedal jibalu suyirat, wedal isharu otilat, wedal wuhu shu husherat, wedal biharu sujarat, wedan nufusu zuwijat, wedal mauda tu suilat, be ahi them bin kutilat. Wedal suhu, wedal suhu fu nusherat. And my internet's died. I can't go any further. <laughs> But I'll translate for you my translation of these verses I was looking at earlier. It's still the naturalistic image, but it's closer to the sun, the shamsa that you will see downstairs. The shamsa that my mom's produced are, I think, closer to this shamsa, which is a naturalistic image, but placed within a kind of crisis, an ethical crisis. When the sun collapses inward, and the stars become disarrayed, and when the mountains began to fall away, and the pregnant camels are abandoned. <laughs> the pregnant camel being abandoned is like you abandoning your uh, investment portfolio. I.e. like that the world is turning upside down. The pregnant camel has been abandoned. When the beasts of the earth are gathered and the souls of all the people are tethered. This is eschatology. This is describing the end of time, the coming apart of ages. It is then that the girl child killed will be asked for what crime she was killed. And then it goes back to this naturalistic image. And when the scrolls of deeds will be laid open and the cosmos will be stripped away and a great fire will be set ablaze and a garden will be brought near, every self will become aware of what it has done. And then Muhammad's, I mean, the, 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 the surah continues, nay, this is, this is the, the prophet saying, nay, no, I swear by the retreating constellations, the orbits upon their courses and disappear. I swear upon the night that creeps in and the day that breeds life in you, that these are the words of a noble emissary. 
So again, you see the image of the sun, this naturalistic image, but in the Quran, it's not just nature. It's not just the sun. It's something that's embedded into some kind of an ethical reality. Here, that ethical reality is very pointed. It's not a very large uh, topic. It's very specifically this practice of female infanticide. But that practice has been placed inside this image of catastrophe, of the sun collapsing, of the sky uh, fading away. So it's a very powerful image in that way. I think the shamsas my mom has made are in line with this uh, emotion, perhaps. Uh, and as you know, the pieces that you're going to see are all covered in text. Some of those texts are Quranic. Some of those texts are not Quranic. I went downstairs and I chose three paintings that I like a lot. And I thought that I would uh, speak to you guys a little bit about the texts that my mom has incorporated into these shamsas. The form itself, you guys just have to go and visually experience the form. It's the sun, uh, but it is within, it's not just a naturalistic image. It's embedded within this ethical reality. So now Karuna has always already mentioned uh, Fez Amit Fez and how Fez Amit Fez's uh, poetry has informed my mom's work. Now, part of why this is Dear America, by the way, I mean, I'm giving away a little secret of yours, is that I don't know my mom if my mom ever read Fez in Pakistan. I think she had an encounter with Fez in America. And that makes perfect sense because Fez was, like Ami, a displaced individual, a person who was displaced from their homeland and had to contend with new forms, new lives, new realities. And so it makes sense that that poetry is what you've rediscovered in this experience in America, and it, it's so prominent in your art. I love Fez, so I love seeing Fez in my mom's work. He would be called a socialist in today's society. He would be called a socialist in today's society. Yes, and many other things, actually, far worse. <laughs> <laughs> Fez was not well liked during his lifetime, but his poetry. Neither was Ghalib. Neither was Ghalib. Yeah, yeah. So, well, yeah. <laughs> But his poetry has stood the test of time, continues to speak to generations of people even after, prominently. You see it even at the most, and I don't mean this derogatorily, but I mean at, even at the most vulgar level, at like the level, level of Coke Studio, where it's essentially just entertainment, but that those words have for me, it's not vulgar. What I mean is like the vulgate, the, the vernacular. Vernacular perhaps is a better word. Yeah, vernacular. Not vulgar in the sense of obscene, vulgar in the sense of accessible. It's not, the art, it's not necessarily only the poetry as the poetry of Ghalib or Mir or someone which is a bit elevated, takes a bit of archaeology and a monocle to figure out what he's trying to say. With Fez, even though his poetry is complex and has a very rich Urdu in it, there's something about it which is democratic. Maybe that's the socialism that he just mentioned. Yeah. So the first piece I wanted to give you guys a little intro to before you go see it <laughs> is if you look at the sheet, it's the piece called the Octagon Shamsa. It's going to be on the left side when you guys go downstairs. The Octagon, uh, it's, this, it's a large piece you'll see. It's in black and gold. It's one of my favorite pieces my mom's made. Um, and the reason I like it is because right in the smack in the middle of it, she's placed a black tile octagon. The Octagon, like the Shamsa, Octagon Shamsa 1. Oh, is, it a, is, it a, is there a 2? Oh, there's a 2. I'll say. So it's Octagon Shamsa 1 on the bottom. Um, the octagon here, the Shamsa's turned into an octagon. There's gold behind it, but it's black tile. The octagon also is a sacred symbol within Islamic art. The farther back you go, the more sacred it becomes. The period of time I study, 6th, 7th, 8th century Arabia, they're building octagons everywhere because the early Muslim philosophers thought that the octagon, which is these eight-sided shape, is the perfect shape because it melds together the celestial sphere, which is a circle, and the terrestrial sphere, which is a square. It's a melding together of the two. So it always symbolizes, in early mosque structure, um, the coming together of the sacred, the celestial and the terrestrial coming together. To give you a very easy example to think of, think of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. The Dome of the Rock in the Jerusalem, which is one of the earliest structures in Islamic civilization, uh, is an octagon. It's, an, it's a perfect octagon. It's that idea of the celestial and the terrestrial mixing together. So Fez, the poetry that my mom surrounded in this particular uh, calligraphic style that she's developed, 
uh, The Octagon, is a poem by Fez that he wrote while in exile in Beirut. Displacement was a big part of Fez's experience, I think. At one point, he was in exile in Beirut. He himself was from Pakistan. And he was in Beirut during the period of the 1967 war. And he was seeing, um, well, at least this is what is reported to us later, he was seeing Israeli gunboats shooting um, some kind of artillery into, um, into the territory. There was fighting between Lebanon and Israel going on. And he was in exile away from his family, away from his relatives. Um, and he wrote this beautiful poem about this experience. As you know, Sinai is a, uh, Sinai meaning Syria, Lebanon, that land is a sacred space for Muslims. And he wrote this poem speaking to its sacrality. But again, like the Quranic verses that I shared with you, it brings you back into the ethical reality at the time. The name of the poem is Sina, and the piece that my mom incorporated into, the, into her art, it's about 16 verses, is, uh, I'm going to read it to you in Urdu, yeah? And then I'll translate it. I wrote down a little translation for myself also. But I'd like you guys to listen to the Urdu also. This is a very textual experience. You came from art. You came for art, but you're getting a lot of words instead. All tied together. So he says, Pir barq firozan hai sare vadiye sina. Ay dida hai bina. Pir dil ko musaffa karo. Us loh pe shayad ma bain mano to nea pe ma koi utre. Ab rasme se tam hikmate khasane zami hai. تائید ستم مسلحت مفتیے دی ہیں اب صدیوں کے قرار اطاعت کو بدلنے لازم ہے کہ انکار کا فرما کوئی اترے The meaning in English Once again lightning streaks over the valley of Sinai This is a reference to the Quranic image of Torah the, the, the Torah coming down to Moses It's one of the central images in the Quran of the sky breaking apart and the Torah coming down onto Mount Sinai which is in, in Egypt. Uh, so Fez is using that image, but he's using it for the gun battle that's happening, which is again, lightning is streaking over the valley of Sinai. Oh, witnessing eye, prepare your mind. Maybe now on those stone tablets, a directive anew will come down to us. Now that the regimented, a regimented kind of grief passes for wisdom among the land's elite. Now that an insistence upon this grief is the only opinion rendered by the jurists of law, by the mufti. Ta'ide muftiye din hai. The muftis are preoccupied with insisting on the grief, insisting on the sorrow. And then he says, maybe now to amend this aeon of deference, this age, this epoch of obedience, maybe now a directive of mutiny will come down to us. It's a really profound verse, and I love that you put it into your poetry, <laughs> into, your, into your art. The other piece that I'd like to talk to you about is um, in Punjabi. Uh, and it's by Bulle Shah, and it's a piece called A Deconstructed Shamsa. You're going to see it when you go downstairs on this side, on the right side. I, thought, I think that's where they put it up, right? On the left side? On the left side. <coughs> It's a deconstructed shamsa. It's a shamsa exploding on, its, on itself. And I, and I love the poetry you've put next to it because it's the poetry of Bulisha. Now, I mean, were you exposed to Bulisha also in America? No, okay. So you brought Bulisha with you from Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> Bulisha, of course, is a 15th century poet. So we're not, no longer in the 19th century, 20th century. We're going way back. But he was writing his art, his poetry, is a, represents a, a particularly rich period of confluence between Islam and Sufism, between the Bhakti movement, between, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that's particularly recognizable as an indigenously Indian subcontinental form of Islam, which makes it so special, especially in this day and age where the place of Muslims within the subcontinent, perhaps, within India, has a bit of a question mark on it. There is a sense that they're outsiders, perhaps. But Bulla Shah's writing is an example, is testimony to how Islam became something very different, very rich, very important within the Indian subcontinent. And that form does not exist outside of it. It's an Islam of India, essentially. So it's part of, uh, she's incorporated that into one of these pieces. And I want to read to you 
a translation of the line. Now this one feels like a little bit of a message to me because it's about how um, people who read too much don't know much. <laughs> So, and it's this beautiful piece. You'll see when you go down and you'll see how she's ex expressed it in her art. I, I'm not, again, an art historian, so I have a hard time explaining, but it's a, it's a book. You'll see these, it looks like pages unfurled. It's about, it's about knowledge and, 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 and books. So I'll read it to you in Punjabi. Par par alam fazil hoya, kade apne apnu padhya nahi. Jaja varda mandar masita, kade man apne vich vadhya nahi. Ami Rose Shetan na Larda Kadi Nafs apne na Ladiani Bullesha Asmani Urdia Pardeae Jera Garbeta Onu Pardeani. So this means I don't have, a, I didn't write out a translation, so this will be extempora. Purper Alam Fazil. Oh, it is on there. Oh, great. Okay. Purper Alam Fazil Hoya. You've read so much and you've become an Alam Fazil, like a big shot scholar. Kadi apne apnu padiyani, but never took a moment to read your own self. Jaja Varda Mandar Masita, so eagerly you enter the mosque and the temple. Kadi man apne vich varyani, but never bothered to enter into your own self. Emi Roshetana Larda, for no reason every day you wrestle with Satan. Kadi naps apne na ladiyani, but you never try to tackle your own ego. Bulle Shah Asmani Urdiya Pardeya. Bulle Shah, you're obsessed with trying to capture things that are flying around in the skies, angels and demons. But you've never embraced the one who sits at home next to you. Beautiful poem. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The last piece I'd like to introduce you all to before you go all downstairs, which is the big thing that we're all here for, to go look at the art, actually, is uh, another piece of my mom's that I really like. And we're going back to, uh, we're going back to Fez. This is, in your handout, uh, Web Shamsa. Web Shamsa. A Neo Shamsa Aquatic Blues Inky Blacks. I like this shamsa because it is uh, somewhat disturbing. I was talking to my mom the other day, actually just a couple of days when I came here, and she was saying something that um, I think forms her art is a sense that art should comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. Mm -hmm. This, I think, is a piece that really does that. It's a shamsa, it's beautiful, but if you understand the symbolism, there's something discomforting, something discomforting about it. Daricha. It's a poem also that she's incorporated in, in text uh, in a very stylistic way. Uh, I'm going to read it to you in Urdu again. I just can't help myself. <laughs> Let's see. Daricha. What do you say? It's a poem again by Fez. Exactly. Sorry. It's a poem, poem again by Fez Ahmed Fez. This poem by Fez is... Of, uh, of being um, um, imprisoned, which unfortunately also is something that my mom has experienced. So I can see why this is influencing your art. He says, Gadi hai kitni salibe mere dariche me, harik apne masiha ke khun ka rang liye, harik vasle khudavan ki umang liye. Kisi pe karte hai abre bahar ko kurba, this is the end. It goes on, but this is the piece that you've incorporated into your art. So I'm going to translate just this piece. He's talking about his prison cell. The daricha is the window of the prison cell. And he says, Gadi hai kitni salibe mere daricha mein. How many crucifixes are embedded into my prison window? Har ek apne masiha ke khun ka rang diya. Each crucifix doused in the blood of its own messiah, of a different messiah. Each of them comes with the desire to connect with God. Vasle Khudawan, the reuniting with God. And this is the this is the breaker. Kisi pe karte hain abre bahar ko kurba, but on one crucifix they sacrifice the spring cloud. Kisi pe mahetab na karte hain. On another they sacrifice the full moon.
it's again an image of beauty. What Fez does so well is he takes images of beauty, mahitab nak, but then puts them into a uh, deeply disturbing context in his poetry, which is what makes it so powerful. This is the poetry that's infused the work of my mom. She started out making these shamsas right here. I'll point with my red, red pointer. <laughs> These are the shamsas she started out making, which are very traditional shamsas. Usually they appear at the beginning of uh, old Quranic manuscripts. It's aniconic. The overarching value is balance. Even though when you look at this kind of piece, for instance, it's not actually symmetrical. But overall, the image is of balance. That's like the highest artistic value. Um, and there are different styles. Like this, start, this style right here is particularly Indo-Iranian in Indic in, in, in some ways. This one over here is more reminiscent, perhaps. Akan Maghrabi style of art. This is the first piece that my mom made where uh, she was making a shams she'd been making these shamsas and then all of a sudden came out. I took it. So it's actually hanging in my house because I love this piece. And I call this piece, this is the first time, I mean, I call this piece an exploding shamsa. <laughs> it was an exploding shamsa. And even though it's breaking from all of the rigidity and all of the intricacy of the traditional shamsas, it maintains one very important ingredient, which is that the words that she's written around the, the shamsa itself, if you go and look closely, are the Arabic word al-mizan, which means the balance, the equilibrium. So again, it's about the equilibrium. And then that grew into what you'll see uh, downstairs, big shamsas with big ideas behind them. Um, so these were my notes. I hope this has prepared you. The last thing I just wanted to say was this ties together, going back to Dear America. How is this art American? You know, I mean, we're thinking about even the position of American Muslims. Um, how is this art American? This art is American because it's produced by someone who lives in Virginia and has brought this whole world with her on her back and put it down here. And there's elements of Islamic culture, elements of Persian culture, elements of Indian culture, there's Punjabi, Urdu, all sorts of stuff melded together into some kind of perfect harmony and brought into America. And it's her like message to America, dear America, Pyare America. <laughs> Which is, this is a representation, I would say, of American art. It's a representation of this experience. It's not something foreign, it's something indigenous that we need to embrace and accept as part of our tradition as Americans. Hope you guys all enjoy the art. Thank you for listening to me.